so we will get the true label and the image from those arrays now and also the images, okay and now we will remove the X ticks again like we previously did as well as the Y ticks so they're not in the way and not confusing us Hello and welcome everyone Today I'm back with another TensorFlow tutorial walkthrough and the last time I did this I did the most basic um, quick start of TensorFlow that they provide on their website and today we will go a bit more advanced but still pretty basic and we will do this tutorial here from their website I will link it in the description and this is a basic classification still but this time we'll classify images of clothing and we have a few more steps in this uh, tutorial where we pre-process the data I don't think we did this last time because it wasn't necessary and uh, we'll look at a few different like metrics and stuff and how we can set it up so yeah, we'll do this one today I'm using Google Colab again see up here colab research google but you can just type in google colab and also leave a link and yeah you can use gpus on here which we'll probably not need but it already has most of what you need for machine learning or ai in specific it has it pre-installed so that makes it pretty easy to like get up and running so i'll use that for today so the first thing that we'll need is of course TensorFlow and for that we will do some imports import TensorFlow as TF and now it's connecting to our runtime and initialize the VM and stuff and then we're done we get a little check mark here okay also the tutorial says we'll need numpy later on which like in pretty much everything I code I import numpy as np it's just needed for everything and then if you want to look at anything at all you will need the plotting library matplotlib .pyplot as plt and then it also suggests that we look at our TensorFlow version let's see 2.6.0 alright so like I said this time we will use the fashion MNIST uh, dataset I'll put it over here again here it, you can see that it has like black and white images just small images of items, so like there are a few bags in here and some shirts, some pants, so it's still pretty basic the shapes are pretty similar across the board so it's still easy to distinguish them from each other but it's a bit more advanced than just looking at handwritten digits so we'll use that one for today and that one is also given to us within the tensorflow package so no real data that we need to download yet so that's in tensorflow keras data sets there are a few different ones in there and we will use the fashion mnist and then with this variable we can use train images and train labels and we will also get train, no, not train, test images and test labels if we do fashion mnist dot load data let's try this and see if I wrote everything correctly and that will download the data from somewhere on Google apparently and that's already done in one second and yeah, so we have two different data sets training and test 
testing and we can look at these now and let's just see train oh, train images dot shape so we get 60,000 images in the training set and they are each 28 by 28 pixels and Then the train labels. Let's also look at the shape, but I assume, yeah, it's just 60,000. And then let's look at the first entry, for example. And the first entry is in line. Now that's a bit confusing because, like, why is it in line? I thought we're looking at fashion items. Now, that's a bit weird. The website explains that each number corresponds to um, a class. So, zero is t-shirt, one are trousers, two is a pullover, three is a dress. is a shirt, so I assume a, a long sleeve shirt. Um, seven is a sneaker. Eight is a bag. And nine is ankle boots. So we have that here. So if train labels the first entry is a nine, that means the first training image is an ankle boot. And I will just copy paste this class names array because we will need it later on if we want to print which class something belongs to without looking it up every time in this table here. Okay, now the next step always is to explore the data. And yeah, I already did it. Can I? Oh, I have to move it down here. Okay. I already did it a bit up here in this cell, but we can also look at the whole train labels and we see that they are nine, so ankle boot, and then zero, which is t shirt, and another t shirt, and so on and so forth until the end where we have a dress, a t shirt, and zero, one, two, three, four, five, a sandal. So that's the training data set, 60,000 images. Maybe I'll put it up here again. Train images dot shape for 60,000. And then the test images, we haven't looked at those. They are very similar, but we have. Okay, well, that was not the smartest. I wanted the shape. So they are also, of course, 28 by 28 make much sense otherwise, but they are only 10,000. We need to do some pre-processing of the data and normally that's a quite advanced step, but since this is just a tutorial, it's still quite simple. But what's happening is that the images, if we look at the first image, you see that they have quite high values inside, so something like 236 and stuff, and that is because, um, as is quite usual in images, they have values from from 0 to 255, and that's the brightness of the pixel. Zero is black and 255 is white. And like everything in between is a different shade of gray. So it's just a black and white image. I don't know if I said this earlier, but yeah. So that's quite normal for images. But since we're doing uh, a newer network, we need them to be between minus one and one 
or in this tutorial they do 0 to 1, which you can do, but typically it's better if the data is zero centered, but we'll just do it like the tutorial once and maybe we'll try zero centered at the end if we still have time. Okay, so this is a problem. Um, I'm not going to go into detail why this is a problem, but basically the gradients or the values while you multiply a lot of times in the neural network, they will get very, very big and they will sort of ruin the computation, so to speak. It's best to have them between minus one and one, like I said, and also this um, has to do with the activation function, which differentiates between negative and positive values, and if you put a lot of big values in there, um, there will not be this amount of fine-tuning possible. We can talk about this in another video in detail. Let's just focus on TensorFlow for now. Okay, we want them between minus one and one. Let's just accept this. And we can also look at one of the images instead of looking at this weird matrix that doesn't tell us a lot. We can use the nice plotting library. We create a figure and then we will do imshow on the first training image. I think I can just run this. Yeah. Um, this we're now we're doing this again. It's not that grey. It's that grey. I can never remember. Okay. So this is more accurate because it's not really yellow and purple or whatever. It's just black and white. But I mean, you can assign whatever colour you want to black and white and then, you know, you get purple and yellow apparently. So yeah, it's this black and white picture. And we can also get a color bar and then you can see that white is like 250-ish and zero is black and you know like 100, 150 is like gray. That's one of the images and we want them not to be between zero and 250, instead we want them between zero and one. So a very simple thing that we can do is just to take the training images and just divide them by 255. Alright, but let's not overwrite this in case we want to look at the other images later. So let's call them train images processed. And now if we look at the first one of those, we see that it has values between 0 and 1. So like now 0 0.5 or something would be grey, and we can repeat this plot from up here with the new images. And yeah, now you can see that the image still looks the same if we uh, present it, but the values only go from 0 to 1. So that's exactly what we intended to do. And now we can... Oh, we also, of course, very important, almost forgot. We also need to do the same with the test images, of course. And it's important that you... If you would divide between, uh, with a different number here, you need to do the exact, exact same thing for the test images. You can apply the same function that would use the test images, you can only use the training images to decide on that number. You can never look at the test images to determine your pre-processing. Then you would just break the machine learning spirit, so to say. It's not spiritual, but you know, it would uh, bring a lot of statistical errors into it. Just always remember to do the same thing on the training and on the test images. All right, now let's look at the first few images from the training data set. All right, now let's create a figure that's a bit bigger. Can I just run it like this? No. Okay, so we need to say fake size is 10, 10. And then 
we want to print 25 images and for each of them we will address one of the subplots so we will take subplot and we need a 5 by 5 plot because we have 25 images and then we want to address the i plus 1 of them because uh, they start at 1, not at 0 and our 4 loop here starts at 0 and now let's do plot im show again and we use the train images processed of i and we use again the gray with an a maybe c map we'll see later if it works and we will label these so we know which the correct classes and this will be our class names array which was just you know the strings and we want it at the index which is told by the train labels at place i let's run this this takes a while okay and now we can see a few of the images but we can only see the the labels for the last row that's unfortunate why is it like that all right let's say plot x ticks is that the reason apparently don't ask me to explain this oh this removes the x ticks all right okay okay so you see how at the vertical axis it says like 0 10 20 and that's the number of the pixel that it is so like at this point it's 20 pixels and then there's another uh, 8 below that and without the slime here it used to do the same for the bottom axis and i think the plot was just too small maybe to then still show the labels it just doesn't like to do it but yeah if we remove those by passing an empty list to the x ticks and also we can do the same for the y ticks because we don't really need those indicators yet then it can write below it and yeah we see a few of the images we have a boot a t-shirt that's also a top apparently a dress that's also a t-shirt look i don't know these are some very questionable fashion choices we have a pullover we have sneakers we have sandals and also flat sandals so these are a bit difficult but i mean they have holes so that's probably how the neural network will tell them apart and down here we also have a coat and a bag which to me just looks like a fuzzy rectangle but what do i know about fashion right now let's finally get to the model so let's build the model and for that we need to set up a few different layers and we do this by using tensorflow carrots and then the sequential um, class which will allow us to pass in a list of layers and just it just chains them one after the other so the first thing we'll need which is very handy in tensorflow is in layers we use flat and we tell it that the input shape as we know will be 28 by 28 and the next one will just be a fully connected layer or as the cool kids in tensorflow say a dense layer and for some arbitrary reason we want 128 units in this one i think they just tried a few they don't really 
say Y and on that one we want an activation function and we can just add this here by providing the string of saying we want a relay and the next one will already be our output layer another dense layer but we only want 10 output units and no activation function never put an activation function behind the last layer and we want 10 units because units because our data set has 10 classes and our model would provide the probability for each class that the given image belongs to that class handy but also you always need to make sure that you have 10 different outputs okay now we will not directly get a probability out of that one but we will get a score and if we then run this through the softmax function then we get a probability between 0 and 1 for each class but we'll get to that later for now we also need to compile the model which is weird tensorflow concept because as far as i know i mean maybe it's based on c but python is not compiled it's interpreted because it's a scripting language and they still call it compile it's it's weird but they they do it and it's quite handy in a way because now we can add the loss function and the optimizer and also some metrics which is very handy to our model so we will do model oh i also need to run this okay so the model that we created here we will compile it with some additional nice things see it also already prompts us to give it an optimizer and the oops oh now it's gone but it showed us that the default is apparently RMS prop, but we will use Adam for now, quite simple. And then we will also give it a loss function, which the default is none. I don't think it works with none, but nevertheless, we will use cross entropy, which is in TensorFlow, Keras, losses, and then sparse categorical cross entropy at some point i have to look up why it's called sparse categorical cross entropy but that day is not today and from logits true also no idea why you have to write this i will also look it up at some point and then a nice met we can provide multiple metrics here i think you have to do it in this sort of list but the only one that we want for now is the accuracy and that's all for our compile and i think i have one closing bracket too much here okay let's run this and it worked so now we come to the exciting part maybe and that is training the model now for the model to train we need to give it training images and training labels so it can adjust and will know which is good and which prediction is bad and then it can hopefully improve over time so training in tensorflow works with model.fit and we pass it x and y as you can see here so x are let's just write it like this x are our training images the processed kind and why are the training labels and then batch size is quite interesting but we'll skip this for now then we also say epochs let's do 10 for now and now let's scroll down a bit and we can go down further okay and then let's run this so we see first epoch and 
the loss is already decreasing, it's like 0 0.5 and now it's 0 0.4-ish and you see the accuracy is going up, so we have 82%, then 86, 87%, now we're at 88 and yeah, the loss is like how many mistakes the network makes, so to speak and some mistakes are worse than others, so they get like a higher value so it's good when the loss is going down and yeah, the accuracy is just how many images it guesses correctly each time so now we're at like 91% and out of interest, let's run it 50 times oh, we start at... oh, that's interesting, so if we run it again, it remembers its progress so far so I probably have to compile it again, or maybe initialize it again to really reset it so in total it will now train for 25 epochs, the 10 we did at first and now the additional 15 it's good to know, so I've completely trained this and you can see that in the end it didn't really improve a lot, it stayed at like 93% it barely made it over the 94% here but that's just a training data set, which is not really telling us a lot to really evaluate if our model is now of any use we need to evaluate it and that means we look at the test data set so these are the images that the model hasn't seen yet and to do that we use model evaluate and we again pass x, which in this case is the test images processed and y will be the test labels and also apparently verbose equals 2, no idea what that means but we save it in test loss and test accuracy this and oh okay it already tells us that the accuracy is 88% or like almost 89% on the test data set so here you can see the difference on the training images we got 94% because we showed them the same images over and over again and at some point the network just knows what the images are without having learned any patterns so to speak but we can also see that we have learn quite a few patterns, because probably the images are very similar and we get 89% roughly of test accuracy now let's look at what the model is predicting and like what those predictions actually look like because I talked about probabilities at the start, or like somewhere in the middle and like all of that kind of stuff so let's look at this in a bit more detail so we will use the softmax function which we get, we use this to get probabilities, like I said, between 0 and 1 so for this tutorial we will create another sequential model for that one and as one layer we will use actually our model that we just created and then also the important part the softmax layer and then with this one we can if I could type that could help we will do some predictions and we will use this probability model so we actually get probabilities out there and we will predict on the test images so I guess that's a sub-function of evaluate evaluate puts in the images and also the labels and tells you uh, how good it performed and if you only have images and no labels you can just use the predict function to get the predicted labels and now the let's look at predictions.shape so that's 10,000 because we did the test images and 10 because it will give us a value for each of the 10 possible classes and if we look at the first one now 
we see that it gives us a zero for all of them, except for the last, where it's very sure that this one is one. It's quite unusual. Does it do this for all of them? We should also use the correct test dimensions, the processed ones. Yeah, and now we get a bit of a more nuanced uh, answer. Now we see that the biggest number is the second one. So we can also evaluate this without having to look at the numbers because we are lazy programmers. So we use the argmax of the prediction 15 here and that's number one so zero one that's the biggest probability so the network thinks that it's most likely that it's class one which was if we look at our class names of one so it thinks the image is uh, it's an image of pants now we can see if this is correct by looking at the test labels that we have and also look at index 15 and it also tells us one which is pants. So now the tutorial creates a visual presentation of how correct or non-correct the predictions are. And for that one we will create two functions first. So the first one is plotting an image with a few extra things. So we will pass um, the index and the predictions array, the true label, so we know if it's correct, and also the image itself. Oh, no, these are all the images. And we will get... God, this is so messed up. So these are all the true labels, these are all the images. So we will get the true label and the image from those arrays now. And also the images, okay. And now we will remove the x ticks again, like we previously did. As well as the y ticks, so they're not in the way and not confusing us. And then we will use the imshow of the image and we will use a grey cover map so it's black and white. And now the predicted label will be like we did above the uh, index of the maximum of the predicted. predicted label is the same as our true label, then it's correct, and they will set the color to blue. And if it's not, the color will be red. What color, you might ask? Good question. Now we will write below the image, which is the X label. Oh god, okay. So they do this weird formatting string. This is a placeholder, um, which is curly brackets open and closed. And then we have a space, and then we have another placeholder. But we also want to format this, so we will do... Honestly, I never understood those formatting strings, but I think it means two um, numbers before it. The decimal point and zero behind this but I guess we will see later and then after this placeholder we want um, a percentage in the string and then they have another placeholder in normal brackets and now we can use the format function on the string to fill those placeholders now the first placeholder will be the class of the image of the predicted label 
So we will look at the predicted label in the class names array. The second placeholder, the percentage thingy, will be 100 times the maximum probability, which is the maximum of the predictions array. And then the third placeholder will be the true class, which is in class names. And we look up the true label. And now we can also, the plot will be in, goodness, will be in the color that we saved up here. It's either blue or red. So if it's a wrong prediction, the text here will be red. And if it's a correct prediction, the text will be blue, so you can easily see without comparing what's in here and in here. Now that's the first function for plotting the image. They also have another function, which will plot the predictions and show us like what the probabilities for each class are, but visually. And similarly, we will get the index predictions array and the true labels and again we will get the true label out of the true labels array and we will here we actually have x ticks and we want the numbers from 0 to 10 but we don't necessarily want y ticks, so empty array again and they save this in this plot and they do a bar plot so for each class we plot a vertical bar so we want 1 for each class, so range 10 we want the classes 1 to 10 um, or 0 to 9 in this case and we will plot the predictions array over those 10 values and they use where oh there okay they use the seven 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 color and then they limit the y axis to zero and one I think I will try out what it does without this soon, but then we also need the predicted label. Which is the argmax of the predictions array again. And now they want to change. The plot at oh that's interesting okay so basically they set the color to red if of the predicted um, bar they will make it red just by default but now they will also make the bar of the true label blue and what they do with that if is if the prediction is true, then it's not red because it was red, and then it's the same thing as the true label, so it will be overwritten with blue again. But if it's wrong, it will be red, and you can easily see it that it's wrong. So these are both of these functions. Now let's actually use them. Let's do what the hell are they doing? They take some rows, they also take some columns, and now they calculate how many images we have, which is obviously the rows times the columns, ta times the columns, and now they create a figure with a fixed size depending on this, so we have two columns and 
only two times none rows. Can't exactly tell you what they're doing here. I assume the plots are supposed to be two wide and then we also need two different columns because we want to first plot the image and then also plot the value array. So now we do a loop of all the images that we want to plot. And for each of them we access a subplot, which will be the subplot will be num rows long and two times the number of columns wide, that makes sense. And we want to access two times i plus one. The plus one again because we started one and we won't always skip two plots. And then we want to plot the image at the subplot. So we pass an i, which is our index, and the predictions array will be predictions of i. And then also put in the test labels, and so these are the true labels, and the images. And then we access the other subplot next to it. Um, the first two parameters are always the same. And then we want 2 times i plus 2, so offset by 1. And in this one, we want to plot the value array. Again, index i, predictions array will be predictions of i, and we also need the true labels, which are the test labels. And then to make it a bit prettier, we can use the type layout function and run everything. So here we can see the ankle boot is 100% sure. Um, we also have the shirt, so here it's not 100% clear. It might also be a t-shirt it says, but it's more convinced of the idea that it's a shirt, which is correct. And here's one where it's not correct. Here it says with a lot of certainty that it's a sandal. But in case, uh, in this case, it's a sneaker, and you see that we have quite high wrong probability for sandal, and not so much for sneaker. And here another one which is quite certain for code, but it could also be two or six. Whatever that maybe do we have one that is two or six in here? Yeah, here six is a shirt. I mean, yeah, the code could also be a shirt, I guess but it has buttons in the middle, which is probably how it's, uh, how it's saying that it's a code. And two is a pullover, so yeah, that's also quite similar, so that makes sense, but surprisingly it's very certain that it's a code, which doesn't say a lot because it was also very certain that it's a sandal, so you can't, you know, it doesn't really tell you a lot about the quality of the prediction. Now, if we only took one picture of a clothing item, or, I mean, it would have to be a 28 by 28 pixel image of a very specific clothing item, flat lay and in black and white. But say we took a picture, so we just have one image, which for now we will take out of the test image set, because I'm not about to take a picture for this. And now we have to be a bit careful, because if we only have one image, it has the shape 28 by 28, but the model always expects a bunch of images at once. And of course you can also pass in one image, but you have to expand it a bit first by using the numpy expand dims function, where you pass in the image and you say that you want an additional 
dimension at index 0. And after that, the image will have the shape 128 by 28, which just wraps the matrix in brackets, but now it's a group of images, except the group is only one big, but that's enough for the model because it just expects something that has three dimensions and now it has, even though it's only one image. And now we can use our model, the probability model, to predict on this image. And then it gives us did the same mistake again. We of course want the processed. Did I also do this here? I also did this here. Processed images, please. Let's do this again. Looks the same, surprise, surprise. Also made the same mistake, surprisingly. But yeah. Let's use the processed test image. And now we get this model and we can use our nice plot value array function by using why did I do I? Let's do one. Pass the index one and use our output, which is, let's save this in single prediction. Then let's pass in this single prediction and the first one because, again, let's look at the shape. Because it's a batch, it will not be just 10, it will be 1 by 10. So if we then do first of those and look at the shape it will just be 10 which is what we need to plot it just an array of 10 values and also we need the true labels and now you can see that it's very short that it's a 2 which is correct which is a pullover yeah we can also get the arc max again like before but just to reiterate the arc max and this will also tell us it's two which if we pass this into the class names it tells us that class two is the pullover and that's how we would use the model to predict a single image and how you could use it for example if you deploy the model to a website and let users upload images and stuff but yeah that's the end of this tutorial we looked a bit more at evaluating the data and a bit of pre-processing and hopefully in the next one we'll get more advanced and maybe i'll do a lookup of some of the functions and explain some of the functions in TensorFlow next because I'm really interested in like the cross entropy loss and stuff but also let me know down below what your requests are for coding from preferably like machine learning or python content and maybe I can do that one in the future but yeah thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one Bye.